How's it going, everybody? This is the Uncanny Omar from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And today I have the pleasure to be talking to Jason Aaron. Welcome back to the channel, Jason. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Thank you to Greg and IDW for putting all this together. And we are here to talk about comic books today. You're one of my favorite writers. And the last time I had you on the show was in 2021 we were talking about the possibility of a thor jason aaron omnibus i hadn't announced it yet but i remember tagging you and i'm like oh i finally got to announce it man and you were like right. oh we're actually getting one so a lot now of things got, now we got two of them and war of the realms oh that's right yeah that one's huge yeah we got the war of the realms omnibus along with your two jason aaron thor omnis it's wonderful to have all of that on the shelf um but you got other works that we could also use in an omnibus format. Scalp is coming yeah. out in an omnibus format. That's yeah, a big deal. That's right. That's exciting. Yeah. And it's going to be a two volume set because those five OHCs have been out of print for years. Mm -hmm. But the big news that I'm sure a lot of people want to hear is you announced not so long ago that you were going to be the new writer on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles published at IDW. That's right. So how did that come about, man? How did that happen? You know, you know it's the guy growing up. Yeah. I mean, going back to the, to the original Mirage studios book, you know, this was, this is, this is the 40th anniversary of the turtles. Right. Which is wild. And I discovered that wow. <laughs> book. I think issue three, three or four was my very first one I ever picked up. Um, so for me, it was very much about that original series, you know, before, before the movies, before the cartoons, anything, anything like that, I, I, I fell in love with that original book. So it's, it's really just one of those gigs that kind of popped up out of the blue, you know. Since I um, was no longer Marvel exclusive, I've that's the, the fun thing is I've been able to kind of take any phone call and field any offer that comes my way and see if it's something that feels right, you know, in this moment in time. So I kind of entered that period of you know, free agency, I guess, for the first time, first time not being exclusive in what, almost 15 years or so. Wow. It really with no grand plan of just like, Hey, let's see what's available. See what the options are. You know, I knew I wanted to do some DC stuff for the first time. So I lined up a Batman book and a, you know, it's a short Superman story and, and then just kind of, was open to whatever else came along and turtles was one of those things that just kind of popped up out of the blue. And I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do that. That sounds, sounds like a lot of fun. And this is a, this is a, a licensed property, uh, but it, but it is interesting because it's not like Marvel or DC Superman and Wolverine or Punisher. Uh, this is something that has traveled around from different publisher to publisher uh, throughout the decades and had had so many incarnations, you know, between the video games and the car the many different cartoons and even in the comic book universe. Um, and I know you've been asked this so many times already, but uh, I just wanted to let our viewers know when you're writing this, this is going to be a relaunch of a number one, right? It's going to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one again. Um, right. Is this a continuation of the series, or will this be the Crisis on Infinite Turtles reboot? No, it's a, it's a relaunch. It's not a reboot. You know, the, the IDW book has been going, the main series, for, for 150 issues, and then you mm -hmm. add in kind of all the tie-in miniseries, like a lot of, lot of Turtle stories IDW has been doing the last several years. None of that stuff is... Is you know um, is is being changed or going away? Same continuity, but this is a um, relaunch. Great jumping on point, kind of um, you know a, a period of time has passed between the end of uh, Sophie's run, the previous run, issue one hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. and when we when we catch up with the turtles in this new number one. Um, so you really, you know, if you've if you've been reading that stuff, there'll be a continuation. We carry on from where those characters were, were left off in some sense, but also jump ahead and pick up with them in, in the uh, fresh settings, um, facing a brand new villain. Um, so it's, 
it's new stuff, but also, you know, uh, in the midst of the, the, like I said, the 40th anniversary, for me, it was very much about looking back to where those characters started, looking back to that original Mirage Studios series and wanting to try to capture some of the, the grit and rawness of that original book, you know, mm-hmm. in the, with, with, in, in the way that I kind of do stuff like that. So it's, um, it's very much me kind of going back to ground somewhat with the turtles focusing in on the four brothers um, and putting them in the midst of, you know, some challenges we haven't seen them face before. So you're the, the way that the series is kicking off is really unique uh, because you're, you're having the alpha one shot that comes out in June. And then after that is when TMNT number one comes out and that's in July. But what has already been announced was issue one is going to focus on Raphael and it's going to be with Joel Jones. And then you have Mikey with Raphael Albuquerque uh, issue three is with Cliff Chang. And it's focusing on Leo and Chris, I think it's Chris Burnham is doing issue number four and that focuses on Donnie. So you're taking, right. it's almost like the old Mirage way of like the spotlights, right? Okay. We're focusing on these turtles, getting to know them a little bit more. And then we're going to focus on them, bring them all together uh, perhaps. And are these rotating artists that you're going to be working with, like coming back? No, n- not exactly. I mean, I think we'll talk more about the the ongoing art plan um, mm-hmm. as we go. But um, yeah, I mean, it, to 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 me, I, I liked the idea of of focusing in on the um, each of the individual brothers in their own issues. Like you said, something that's been done going back to that original series. So we pick up with each of them. They've kind of gone their separate ways and and where some of them end up is pretty surprising. And like I said, uh, the places we haven't seen them all in necessarily before and stories are very much set the tone. I think the Chris Burnham, in addition to doing issue four also draws that the story and the alpha issue that comes out in June Mm -hmm. and that, that story in particular, it's, it's also focuses on Donnie to me it was like a tone setter i wanted to kind of establish like this is this is the tone of the book we're going for um and and like i said it's in some way a throwback to to where the where these characters started while also taking them them forward you know in a way i think we haven't seen before so i think chris was the absolutely perfect choice for that and, and nailed it um 110% and then, so, yeah, um, I loved, I love getting to play with each of the the brothers individually before we worry about throwing them all together. The um, the idea of having to play with the toys, as you say, um, you know, you're you're not. It's not new to you. You've been doing that with Avengers. Uh, you've been you've been doing it with Wolverine and the X Men. Uh, some with soups and then Batman, but it's really interesting to me how a writer handles that. And when you're coming into a book, let's just use Avengers as an example. When you were pitched Avengers and you wanted to create your own team, were editors at any point like, well, you can't use so-and-so because they're busy doing this, or you have to use Robbie Reyes as your ghostwriter because Danny Ketch is hanging out in hell right now. Does that happen? And did that happen with Turtles too? Was there anybody that you're like, oh, I really wanted to use said character in this, you know, without going into spoilers, of course. The, and I mean, like, well, you can't because of this. No, I mean, t- yes, of course, things like that always happen. I mean, I've been, like you said, I've been doing this a long time. I was at Marvel a long time, mm-hmm. sat in a lot of retreats. You know, we all we all have to share these characters, right? None of us own any of this. We all have to play well together. So yeah, you always got to be aware of what, you know, this other creator is doing with that character. I mean, in particular, in terms of Avengers, no, that, that was very much the, the Avengers cast I wanted, you know, I very consciously wanted Robbie Reyes ghostwriter. I knew I kind of always knew when I got to do Avengers, I wanted a ghostwriter on there. When I got to that point, I decided I wanted to be, to be Robbie. So that was very much the cast I wanted for that book. And I mean, in turtles is the same way. Again, it's not that complicated initially in that we're focusing just on the four brothers. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's very much trying to, to focus in, you know, just on where things started and go from there. So initially it's, it's, it's just those four guys and we will expand the, the cast, uh, you know, a little bit as we go. 
and and it's a it's a huge cast of characters that have you know that has been built up in, you know in particular in this this ID w run yeah um so we're not throwing any of those characters away um you know they will there will be a place for pretty much everybody in the the broader overall idw publishing plan which i think they've revealed some of that and there'll be kind of more getting announced as as things go has anybody told you you're le- like you're living the dream jason whenever it comes <laughs> to writing it's like okay I mean, you're I- playing you're playing with all our toys, man. You got turtles. Uh, you've had Star Wars. I didn't even mention Star Wars. You got to play with Star Wars. As a matter of fact, you were the headliner for Star Wars when Marvel got the rights back from Dark Horse. That was huge, and True, that book yeah. blew up. You oh. sold a million copies of that book. And 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 the Omnis, by the way, were reprinted and gone again. Just saying, just saying. Like, yeah. Now there's about to be there's some new. Uh, Star Wars collection, right? That they're about to. It was the follow-up like, to your series, the Gillen series. Yeah. No, but uh, there's some new like trade trade paperback. Oh, the modern epic collection. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, it, it's amazing that you know you've gotten to play with some of our favorite toys. It's so cool to see. And, and you're such a nice guy. I don't know if anybody has ever met you at a convention. It's like he's such a nice, humble dude. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this every time we talk that you write these over the top badass characters, but if anybody had the chance to meet you, not that you're not badass yourself, like, <laughs> uh, <it's> your, <laughs> you're not the loud, obnoxious type of characters that sometimes you write in your books. You're quite the opposite. Really nice dude. And I've always said that about you. Well, well, you know, thanks. They also say it's the quiet ones you got to watch out for. So, um, you never know. I'm sure you got to be a little mad to be writing all these uh, stories. So sure. No, uh, I feel like I'm a you know, I, I'm a generally happily happy, well adjusted guy. I think I work out any of my inner aggressions or or in, troubles in the on, on the page, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I remind myself every day, you know, how lucky I am to get to do this and how much fun this is. Like I've never, I've always said that if I get to the day where you know, I don't appreciate this job and I'm not having fun doing what I do, mm-hmm. then I need to go find something else to do for a living. Right. But I haven't, haven't gotten to that day yet. Don't imagine ever getting there because this is literally what I've wanted to do since I was a kid. You know, I fell in love with comics, a very young age, learned to read from uh, reading comics and said pretty early on that, you know, this is what I want to do for a living. Took me took me a long time to get there, but once I did, it's kind of been no looking back. You know, like this is what I want to do. It's never, I've never looked at comics as a stepping stone to like, well, I really just want to, you know, uh, jump to Hollywood and 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 do that. Certainly, I have interest there and and things I you know always want to be involved in. But at the end, of, I mean, I want to die writing comics. You know, this is someday in my obituary, it's going to read comic book writer jason aaron you know died today while working on an issue of who knows what batman um like that i mean this is really what i want to do forever i I love hearing that because i i think sometimes you know there is this misconception when it comes to uh writers that sometimes there it's a stepping stone the comics that they're using to get to the oh i've always envisioned this as a tv series or or a con or a a movie if you will um because we've seen you know that happen in the past all right look, Jason, look I'm I would, to- you know and i i would just say like i certainly there are other things i want to do I, I you know i'd love to write a novel someday I've, I've i've never done that well i did like really crappy ones years ago that hopefully nobody ever reads but so there are other things i want to do but comics for me will always be at the center of, of whatever I'm doing and everything else will, will be secondary to that. As long as right. comics will have me, you know, if I get to the point where, where it, it it done seems like, then, I'll, then I'll screw off and go, go write some, you know, it, it seems like they all want you. You've got stuff at DC. You've got stuff at Marvel. Things are being reprinted. Now it's you're been working a very at busy Marvel. year. Yeah. I'm, I'm Man. working for a lot of companies right now at this, at this moment. I haven't even talked to the whole reason I reached out to you at first. Cause the day that Marvel dropped the news about uncle Scrooge, I'm like, I'm going to email Aaron and see what he's doing. <laughs> 
how in the world did that come about? Because it's, you know, Fantagraphics has been publishing a lot of the works of uh, the, the classic stuff by like Carl Barks and then, of course, Don Rosa. Yeah. And it, you know, Boom had it for a long time. But Marvel themselves, even though Disney has the property and, or Disney has Marvel under them, has never had a chance to publish them. So how in the world did that come about and how did you get involved? Well, I'll tell you the, I've, I've never told anybody this story, so you'll get the scoop. This will be the first time we've talked about how this book. Oh came yeah. Talk two to me. Part, I'll give you, I'll give you a two part answer. The okay. first part for me, um, like my connection and, and love of uncle Scrooge came from those fanographics, uh, hardcover editions of the Don Rosa library. Like I bought, mm -hmm. I bought those and started reading them with my kid, like at bed when he was little. And we oh, read, yeah. we read every volume. We read every Don Rosa story. Uh, and I had, I had, I was somewhat familiar with, with some of those. No, most of those I'd never read until we sat down and read them in that form, and which is the very much the form he kind of wants them read in, right? He was very involved with those hardcovers. You know, some of those stories that he added pages to in international editions. So if you pick up those, that Don Rosa library, and I recommend that you do, you're reading the stories the way Don Rosa wants them read, right? Mm -hmm. And there's just some amazing stories, stories that blew me away. I remember reading some of them, and I, I, by the time we got to the end, I was like, dang it, like, that was, that's not just a good story about talking ducks. That was an amazing adventure story, right? Yeah. So smart, so well researched, so beautifully drawn. Just really, really incredible story. So I fell in love with with those characters from the Don Rosa stuff. I've since gone back and read a, lo a lot of the Carl Bark stuff too. But for me, it was very much Don Rosa was my entry point. And my son and I, who's now you know eighteen, uh, fully grown, he and I still talk about those stories. So that for me was that that was my love of Scrooge came from from that. I've you know I've done different podcasts over the years, and they'll ask me like, "Oh, what what characters that you haven't written would you most like to write?" Scrooge was one of the answers I would always give. Well, at some point, Dan Buckley, you mm -hmm. know, president of Marvel Comics, happened to hear one of those podcasts where I mentioned that, and then made the calls to make it happen because of that like because i had expressed the interest in doing an uncle scrooge comic um he and cb and got to get got together and and made it happen um so that's how it came together the the, the grace of of dan buckley um but for me it was just again it was my love of, of don rosa and and i've looked at this like i wrote this book again i I'd sat down literally put on my i have you know, pants that are like the Don Rosa McDuck family tree. Yeah. Uh, that I bought at Disney World. I've got um, Uncle Scrooge socks, got decked out, sat down, had, had an absolute blast writing that script and wrote it very much as a love letter to, to Carl Barks and Don Rosa. And hopefully the, the, the main goal for me is just to pour as much uh, of, of my love for those characters into that one story as I can. And hopefully anybody who picks it up or, it's, you know, the average Marvel comics reader, my average fan who maybe has never read any of those stories, right. Has no familiarity mm -hmm. with those characters beyond DuckTales, but has never read any of them in comic book form. If you, if you pick that up and at all enjoy it, I hope you, you will rush out to buy, um, you know, some of those beautiful fanographics editions of, of those of those stories, so all the Don Rosa ones are have been published. The Carl Barks are still they're still um, still getting those into print, but we still need the first two volumes of Carl Barks. It's gonna be like, well, yeah, I, they've been publishing them out of out of um, yeah, like Marvel Epic chronological like, order. Yeah, brother, I I remember when those were announced, and I remember thinking, okay, doing the math, two a year. What are we looking at? We're looking at at least 14, 15 years before it's all said and done. And I'm looking at my shelf and I'm like, holy crap, how did that time just fly by? I my right. daughter's gonna turn 15 this summer, and I'm like, that that's insane how fast it goes. Cause it feels just like yesterday they were starting it, and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's gonna be 15, 16 years before this is all done. And time, man, it just doesn't slow down. I love, love, love your answer as a fan of Don Rosa and fellow Kentuckian Don Rosa, by the way. And Carl Barks, 
and I'm pointing over here because that's where I keep my books, the top shelf. It makes me so happy to hear you be a fan and and say that this is coming from a love letter to those creators. Uh, yes, because I, I've read a lot of the European stuff, and I've read a lot of I've read a lot of the stuff that followed after Rosa and after, uh, of course, long after Barks. And it seems like they always people, you know, with with coming from the right place, try to recapture the magic of what is Ducktales and what people think the comic should be like. Where it's more like Indiana Jones, and they forget that it was supposed to be like that because that's the way the comics were. So I'm glad that you're taking it back to the true roots of what it is. Now, I know you can't reveal this, or you can't say anything, but if that does do well, I mean, is this something that Marvel would consider doing as an ongoing series? I mean, you know, who knows? I don't. We haven't had those conversations. I mean, certainly, I would love that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of a, a the bigger plan. I mean, the um, the yeah, like you said, the the screw stories have continued um, overseas in Italy. You know, they continue to be to be big, and that those are that's who we're working with on this. And the interior artists are all Italian artists who've been working on Scrooge comics over there, and it's become you know it has sort of its own continuity and history and characters who've been been become big as a part of that um but yeah this is again this is me um uh, and and my love of of don rosa funneled into this but with the marvel twist to it right and this is still a different kind of scrooge story than i think mm -hmm. we've seen before and and um the you know i don't like to talk too much about it i think it'll be pretty obvious when you pick it up but it and it, it even starts with it the with uh, the Carl Bark story starts with Christmas on Bear Mountain, which was the very first, yeah, um, first Scrooge Scrooge. story, and it's sort of a twist on that, uh, and, and goes from there. Um, but yeah, I actually I got to sit down with Don Rosa at Planet Comic Con a few weeks ago and tell him I'd met him there before over the years, and he yeah. signed books for me and my kid, and got to tell him, um, you know, face to face, like how much I love and respect his work and how this book is is based entirely on that love and respect. Oh man, that's wonderful. I love Don. He is he's my type of people. He's like <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him go yeah. off. <laughs> he's very yes. peculiar. We had Don. a long yes, we had a long, you know, hour long conversation um that uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say too much about our talk other than just it's he's a delight. He's a delight. Oh my god, my, my wife and I see him at um, one of your convention. I recommend you go sit and, and chat with him for a while. He he is a blast. I I my wife and I were eating breakfast in Louisville, Kentucky one day, and rec I recognized the back of his head <laughs> just because he, he kind of looks like Scrooge. And I ran out of the restaurant just to go catch him. And I'm like, because I knew he lived in the Kentucky area, and I'm like, Don Rosa, and he was like you are the second Kentuckian that has ever recognized me. <laughs> He's like, I wish I had something for you, uh, to sign. I'm like, no, 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 no. I just wanted to come and say hi. And, and I love your work. And I've been following it for decades since I was young. And oh my gosh. Yeah. And he, he is quite a character. You're getting a lot of praise in the chat, by the way. People are just coming in and saying hi. And, and, and thank you for all of your work. Your Superman story was a master. Thank you for the super chat. Shaz was a master class of the character. It was a badass yet humble. It's dark yet hopeful. What made you take a psychological direction? Uh, thanks. Thanks. I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed that Superman story, my first ever Superman story. Um, you know, I, I mean it, it really just came from me wanting to do a, a you know a darker take on Bizarro. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's I mean, that there's, there's a lot going on in those three issues, right? Like each issue is kind of a different sort of story. You know, the first one is, is just introduces the idea of, uh, you know, Superman has this weakness to magic and Bizarro is his exact opposite in every way. Well, then turns out Bizarro kind of has a knack for magic and he uses that to cast this spell that, you know, transforms uh metropolis into a city full of bizarros and then the second issue is this you know a just dark version of what that means right a character that had, for so many years in his initial incarnation was portrayed as 
for laughs. I just wanted to do a, a darker, grittier version of that. And then the third issue, the Joker shows up. So it's, you know, it's a Superman story that goes to some different kind of places and is very much about giving him a different sort of challenge, right? It's always a question of how do you challenge a character who's that incredibly powerful? Um, and with this one, uh, hopefully we were able to present present Superman with some sort of things he hasn't faced in a while. Um, when last I interviewed you, I we talked a little bit about Jane Foster and how much she meant to you. And I think it, yeah, it was it she's, was before. She's of course, sitting right here on my desk, actually. The yeah, sideshow statue right there. Nice, nice. Out of all the characters that you came up with, is that the one that you get a lot of praise about? Yeah, I mean, I, the um, sure. I mean, I think that's one of the, the characters I've like added to the Marvel tapestry. She's mm-hmm. the one who I think has made the biggest impact, right? And I think I would have said that even before she was in a movie and there were all these toys and everything. I think just the the emotional connection readers made to that story was profound in a way that nothing, really nothing ever else I've ever done, you know, work for hire or create her own is really compared in quite that way where I've, you know, when, when Jane Foster was Thor, it was the first time I would do signings and people would come up and start crying, you know, and then I start crying and then everybody's crying. Oh, and like it was just a different kind of level of connection and response with that story than anything else I've done. And yeah, also, you know, I've got a, my guest bedroom over there is full of Jane Foster uh, Legos and statues and toys and all that kind of stuff. So also that, you know, that she's, um, I think she'll be around for a long, long time, which makes me very, very happy. Um, I hope so too. And I, well, I think, yeah, I don't think that character is going anywhere. So, getting a uh, getting a couple questions about Southern Bastards, which I'm pretty sure we were getting last time too. Uh, yeah. A possibility of a volume two or the GD Virgin Brides in OHC. Yeah, we don't we don't have plans to do Virgin Brides in a big hardcover. Um, some of it just came comes down to sales numbers. Maybe whenever, I mean, there will be more of the, the goddamn, so it might be a matter of when we get back to that, if we're able yeah. to justify doing a, a hardcover version of that. Uh, Southern Bastards, like, you know, believe me, I get asked about that a lot. I would like to be able to, to, to talk more about it, to give you a good answer. Um, you know, there continues to be not much I can say. It's a, it is a, not a simple situation. I wish it was. Um, I continue. All I can really say is I have been working to uh, make more Southern Bastards happen. I will continue to do so, continue to try to sort out that situation. And whenever I do, whenever I can talk about something, uh, mm-hmm. believe me, I will shout it and scream it from the rooftops. Um, but unfortunately, nothing I can tell you right at this moment. Okay. So let's bring it back to turtles. Okay, then we see the the eclipse. Oh, yes, my kids, <laughs> I saw the eclipse. Yeah, I was not. I'm not in the totality here in Kansas City, but uh, yeah, I did get out and and watch it. Where was it? Were you in the totality at all? We were. We were really close, and my daughter came home with her box from school that she made and I was like please don't look directly into the sun but luckily my mom drove up and she had those glasses so we were ready to rock it was really cool yeah uh it was really cool to to see that I I think the last time I maybe the last time I cared was when I was in high school it happened when I was like a senior in high school and that was cool back then and now 46 years old and two kids outside like it was pretty cool to see um when you're writing turtles, because you mentioned the duck comics, you're you're going back to the Mirage era. So, do you deck out in your turtles pajamas and <laughs> turtle socks too when you're writing it? Do you keep it keeping it like a bro? I mean, I do. I don't have turtles pajamas like I do, like I have Scrooge pants. <laughs> I mean, again, I had Scrooge pants, you know, outside of 
knowing yeah. I was someday going to write Scrooge. I just saw those at Disney World and was like, oh, crap, I'm buying those. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I've got some Turtles shirts and, you know, Turtles toys, but I don't have a full Turtles outfit. Um, it's fun to change that, Jason. Yeah, I guess I will have to. I'm gonna run to I mean, I don't, I don't always have to coordinate like my. Oh no, you started something now. I'm working on, <laughs> but it, it, it certainly has happened on occasion. You know, definitely, like I, I got a big sock collection. Like, um, you know, I, any sort of weird pair of socks, mm-hmm. plus like nice. You know, I love stance socks. Like I, I don't know, I'm the, I'm the kind of nerd who actually gets excited when I run across a stance brick and mortar store, right? Like there's one at Disney Springs. Whenever I go yeah. to Disney world, I'm like, Oh, I got to go check out this stance store, see what socks they got. So I'm, I've kind of spent a lot of money on socks. So I definitely have a collection of like nerdy socks. You know, I got lots of Thor socks and, and, you know, various Wolverine socks. So this is definitely, you know, I could suit up for a lot of characters that I write if I wanted to. <laughs> Yeah, um, but that's but you don't have to is what you're saying. You don't right. have to. Gotcha. Okay. Now I know you've been asked this a lot. You know, people are like, "You're writing Ninja Turtles. You grew up with it. You probably watched the show and the movies. Who's your favorite turtle?" But I'm not going to go down that route. <laughs> Good, because I won't tell you anyways. Right. It's like choosing your favorite child. I get it. But who's your least favorite turtle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, the, I mean, well, I very generally don't have an answer to that. If I did, I would. I still wouldn't tell you. Mm-hmm. Would you? I mean, do you want me to hear? You want to hear me say that I? When we just talked about how, with the first four issues of the book, or each focuses on one of the turtles drawn by a different amazing artist. Mm-hmm. I can very genuinely tell you, I was. I have been as equally invested in each of those as I have any of them, you know, getting to write each of those characters work with each one of those stellar artists. I would not trade any one of those issues, any one of those turtles for another. Like I, I love them all equally. Okay. 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 You seem unsatisfied with that answer. I don't. <laughs> I, dude, I got to. I I interviewed Mark Wolfman about five years ago, and it was funny because I took my whole family to see. Like they were behind the camera and they were watching me interview him. And I said, "Who is your favorite? You know, who is your favorite uh, character from the Teen Titans?" And he was like, "Why do people ask me that? That's like asking who your favorite child is." And I had both of my kids there, and I said, "Oh, Lydia, that's my favorite kid." Yes. And he was like, what's wrong with you? And I said, oh, a lot. They know I love them both equally. I get the answer. And now you get to write these stories uh, with these characters. And you have so much uh, to, to, oh my gosh, there's just so much, not only to just borrow from, but to do with as you want to. Uh, is it different writing stories like this and say like Star Wars because it's not only dealing with the license holder for the comics but also the toys, right? Is it would you say it's a little different than writing say something like Avengers or Superman? I mean, you know, sure, like I mean all that kind of stuff is 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 different. I mean, you know, I was at Marvel a long time, like I said, I got to the point where I I knew everybody I had a personal relationship with everybody I was working with. People think of it as this big faceless company. It's in my experience, it wasn't like it was, I, I, I knew everybody I was going to get notes from, right. And, and could mm-hmm. call them up and talk with them. So it's, that's, it's a different sort of experience. I mean, it's different. Every company, again, I'm working for a lot of different companies, right. Yeah. You know, right now at this moment in time and different, different steps of the process. Um, so they're each different. I mean, again, like we're going to IDW, um, uh, like I, uh, Mark Doyle, who's the editor in chief of IDW. I know from, um, my days at Vertigo, right? Like he mm-hmm. was, he was assistant editor on Scalp. So comics is still a, 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 a a pretty small industry. So you make a lot of connections and you still have a lot of those personal connections, even as you start, you know, venturing out to other 
companies. I started doing Once Upon a Time at the End of the World at, at Boom, and that was with Sierra Hahn, who I knew from from back in the day at DC, and now she's editor in chief over at Oni. So, so you work work in comics long enough, you build those connections and relationships and, and yeah it's always different when you're doing something that's like a licensed property or there's another step of the process but it's just a new kind of connection and relationship that you make and it's still all those different situations in, in my experience i've always still felt like there's a relatively small group of us in one proverbial room together like making this thing happen everybody just wants to do a good story right let, let a good version of of the, what these characters are, right? Um, it's always felt like that, whether it's Star Wars or Conan or any of the kind of stuff I've worked on. Um, don't burn any bridges. Oh, absolutely. Yes. The, you <laughs> know, don't important. be a jerk. Don't be a jerk, you know, because uh, everybody remembers who the jerks are. You know, don't burn any bridges because um, it's a small, it's a small, small industry. You never, you never know where you're gonna find somebody else that you worked with in the past. I, I find that that's even though the comic industry is huge, when you think about the people and everything, it's, it's kind of small in, in this group of people that just work together trying to make the best books possible. Right. I mean, it's a good rule of thumb just not to be a jerk, just in general, whether you yeah. work in comics or not. You know, <laughs> that, that that is true. That is true. Don't, don't treat that, people shittily. You know, it's kind of a good rule of thumb. That's uh that that is good. That, that that's some good advice. I'm sorry, I forget that it's not just comics, not comics. Uh, and speaking of connections, how do you really feel about Fred of the Channel Torun Grombeck? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are really close. She spoke highly of you. I I am a huge fan of Torun. Um, you know, we first met at a, a, a tiki bar in New York years ago. So she and, told me, yeah. Um uh, which, you know, of course is like feels like a magical connection to me because tiki bars are a magical place and then i loved getting to work with her on the the jane foster stuff and i've been super thrilled to see her blow up since then and everything she's been working on and she's a yes an, an, an incredibly talented woman not just in terms of her comic book writing but um her, her painting and she's just mm -hmm. one of the smartest most interesting people i've ever met so Yes, huge, huge tour and mark. Um, I, I I buy everything she does, as as should all of you. Wow, seal of approval from Jason Aaron, who doesn't burn bridges. Matt is a huge well, fan. I, of I, I, I mean, I hope I hope not. I'm not trying. To. <laughs> uh, and this might be a hack question. But what does your typical day of writing look like? I mean, it looks like this, pretty much like this. I sit here. Oh, no, no. You got to put on your Uncle Scrooge pajamas, man. You open <laughs> up that door. I mean, I, you know, I the I try to get up relatively early and, and work. I'm, I'm more naturally a night person, but these days I try to, you know, with kids kind of um, makes you try to keep something close to a nine to five schedule. So, I mean, I work from home, uh, try to do a script a week. Mm -hmm. um depending on deadlines but um yeah i mean i just kind of sit here and you know the i mean really like to me the 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 work the actual heavy lifting part of the job doesn't involve me typing on a keyboard at all it's just the mental part of it and figuring you know breaking a story in my head so like you know what is this this issue what is this arc and what are the beats and or specifically what you know what goes on this page or what is this line of dialogue like that's the stuff i do where i'm kind of just sit here staring out the window you know or i take a walk around the neighborhood and or i take a shower like i i think i've figured out a lot of story beats just in the shower so you get out of the shower and quickly like oh i gotta write this down before i forget it right so it's just the the mental part of it of figuring that part out or letting things kind of simmer on the stove you know, until until they're cooked enough. Then by the time I sit down and I'm actually typing, really to me like that, the hard part is done. And you're just kind of filling in the gaps. You know, does that make sense? It makes sense to me. I hope Matt got something out of it in case he's in an aspiring 
comic book writer himself. So yes, so so Matt, a large part of the day involves you doing things that from the outside don't appear to be work because you're just sitting staring. But you know, at some point, I get a check in the mail for what I'm doing when I'm sitting staring out the window. <laughs> like that's the that's the pivotal part of it. Boy, always an instigator's got he's a huge fan and also has a lot of good questions. But we we'll just a couple. Is there any plans for a hardcover for once upon a time when it's complete? By the way, the first trade was awesome. So I can't Thanks. wait to read more. Thanks. Yeah, I think the second trade's out now, and then the third arc is mm -hmm. almost almost wrapped. I know we just the uh, I just did lettering uh on the, the last issue, which looks phenomenal. It's got all three three art teams if you oh if you haven't okay. read once upon a time at the end of the world each arc of it has a completely different uh, art team different artists different colorists as we follow these two characters kind of in different periods of their their life mm -hmm. and then this these last few issues all three art teams are involved and it's uh, alexander tafinki drew the first arc Leila del duca did the second and nick dragata's drawing the third so again like pretty just like on Turtles, I'm pretty lucky in terms of, um, you know, the lineup of artists I'm getting to work with. So, yeah, the, the two trades are out. Uh, third arc's about to wrap up. Is there plans for hardcover? Not that I know of. I haven't asked that question uh, of Boom, but that is a good question. So I would certainly love that if we collected all those together. But I don't know if we've figured that out yet. As, like I said, we're still getting through the, the trade paperbacks at this point. Wink, wink. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you only, uh, this is a really excellent question because I am curious how writers, you know, work like this. Uh, uh, there's the Steve Gerber mentality of writing comics, which is, I don't know what the next issue is going to be. I'll just write it as I go along. And then you have certain writers that come in with an idea that's like, I know how it's going to uh, begin. I know where it's going to lead and I know how it's going to end. Is it just different for every project for you, or do you usually like to say, no, I think I've got an idea of how I want my last issue to be? Yeah, I mean, it, it does. There are varying levels of that, depending on the project, for sure. I mean, for me, I think generally I want to have an idea of where I'm headed. Like, what is the destination? I need to know what is the ultimate destination before we set out on the journey, right? Even if I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there. Or there's room to sort of meander in the middle. I still need to know where I'm headed. So I think most, certainly like any of the longer term projects I've done, like Scalped, um, like my Thor run, I knew pretty early on, this is the end, right? Mm -hmm. With Thor, I knew, you know, this is how it's going to wrap up. This is the last scene. You know, I, I'd figured those things out pretty early on. Um, but I think for me in general, the most important part beyond just the specifics of, of knowing all the major beats or the ending is just how clearly can I see this project, right? Just overall, like the more clearly I see it and that, and, and see it in terms of, you know, who are these characters? What do they want? What are they looking for? What does this project look like? you know, specifically look like, like, a, are there different colors that are important to it? Like if there are different locations, what did they look like? What are the most important parts of the setting? Like everything, the, the more clearly I see that, the the better off the project's going to be, right? The, the more fully I'm going to be able to communicate that, put it on the paper. Um, I, I think that to me is the most important, which I, maybe sounds simple, but it's, is not that that again is like the hard part of it right and sometimes that's a matter of that project's got to simmer on the stove for a bit until it's ready until you can see it that fully um mm. so you can't be if you rushed into it you can always have an idea and you know turn around and write it five minutes later right but that's a different it's going to be a much different version than if you let that simmer and cook and and you know for for three months until you see it more clearly. So sometimes that 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 clarity comes quickly. And like I can, you know, I think with Thor, once I realized, oh, I want to write Thor, it got clear for me pretty quickly in terms of the tone, the look, 
everything I wanted to to try to accomplish with that book. Other other books take time to get there. Do you do you see when you're doing that when you're using the word, the term cook that you might push out a storyline that at one time you thought okay this was going to be twelve issues. Oh boy, I think I just added so much more that I think it's going to be twenty four issues of this particular story arc. Yeah, I mean that you know that stuff happens all the time. I mean the mm-hmm. I think it, my first arc of of Thor, of Thor God of Thunder, I I pulled up uh, with some of the old outlines I did for that, you know, a year or two ago, and they, I think that first arc, you know, what what ended up being eleven issues was initially going to be like five or six, and then they kept growing. I mean, there's no way I could have done all that in, in five or six issues. But as I got into it, that that outline with each you know successive outline, it's like, well, no, it's going to be eight. And then, well, no, it's going to be 10. And then, so, <laughs> yeah, I sometimes things keep growing just because your idea gets bigger, the story gets bigger. It's, it's also just with the publishing game, you've got to be able to roll with punches from the publisher, you know? So working at Marvel, the, it may be a case where, okay, you've got you've got this many issues before this other thing needs to happen, you know, where it's going to be, there's going to be a Secret Wars event or you know, you need to do this issue to tie into this thing, or the, the artist can only do this many issues in a row. So you 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 always have to um, roll with those kind of punches again, because you're not just doing it you're in a vacuum by yourself. You got to take all these other factors into account. So it's not always just, you know, I see it this way. It has to be this way. You've yeah. got to make it work within the, param- the publishing parameters. Well, we got a lot of great questions. Okay, uh, let me just take this one here. Uh, hey, Jason, I loved your treatment of Thor and his relationship with Phoenix, and I adored what you did with Starbrand. How did these ideas come about? Is this what you were talking about, the cooking? You were making spaghetti, and then you ended up with <laughs> spaghetti with meatballs. Yeah, you know, I mean, that the a lot of that Avengers stuff just started with the idea of those prehistoric Avengers. I, I like the idea of doing this kind of, first iteration of some of those great legacy heroes um we'd seen throughout marvel history and some of the biggest most powerful sort of um cosmic weapons or or power sets that have been passed down through time and and so um uh, phoenix and and star brand were two of those so it kind of started with just wanting to do you know basically caveman version of those characters alongside um you know odin and the black panther and Kind of all these different the the the, you know, the ghost writer who wrote a uh, woolly mammoth. Uh, so I started with just that, wanting to do a crazy caveman version of those characters, and then um, uh, seeing how those relationships between those different characters changed kind of throughout time, and do do kind of present day versions of that too. Thank you for that answer. And Shaw's verse, thank you for the super chat. And I can answer this one. Uh, do you have a favorite amongst the TMNT brothers? Uh, for me, it's always been Michelangelo. Uh, I don't speak for Jason because he doesn't want to say who it is, but I'm just going to take a wild guess. It's probably going to be Raphael, but that's just me speaking for him. <laughs> I don't know if that's real or not. Well, I'll tell you, look, I've, the, the I've never answered this question. And again, refused to answer it earlier, but I'll give you sort of an answer. And then I will tell you, because you're asking me today that I was working on a a Donatello story earlier today. So for today, my answer is Donnie. (laughs) But you ask me, you ask me next week, it'll be a different answer. Gotcha. Are you, can you answer this one? The hard hitting question, which turtle do you think is the best fighter? Oh, uh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, I, the, huh, I'm, I'm, I'm torn as to how I want to answer that. (laughs) I think, um, I think maybe if you're going to answer that question prior to this new volume of the series that we're doing, it might be different than once you actually pick it up. So you, some of that I can't answer because I want you to wait and see what have these brothers been through since we last saw them in issue 150? What are, what kind of situations do they find themselves in now? How is that affecting them all mentally and physically? And where do they go from there? 
So maybe who you thought was the best fighter, um, you know, before issue one won't be the same by the time you read issue one or let alone issue four or five. It's Raphael Albuquerque not drawing the Raphael issue. I didn't even <laughs> make that connection, honestly. Um, <laughs> though he's 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 drawing the heck out of the Mikey issue, though. Looks looks really really gorgeous. Um, Jason, I want to. I know you got to get going, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, again, uh, taking time to answer not just my questions, but a few people's questions uh, from the chat. And thank oh, you all. Yeah, for joining. these are good questions. Uh, yeah, some of these were stompers, man. Uh, don't forget to smash that like button. Don't forget to pre-order the TMNT book that will be heading out in June, that it all kicks off with the alpha book that comes out in June. And then, of course, the issues that are following after that with issues one, two, and three, four, five. We haven't, we don't have an artist for five yet, or one hasn't been announced yet. Uh, but Looks like you, you eventually we might get just one artist on the book. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the plan. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, there is an artist for five, but yeah, it hasn't been announced. But it's a it's a very cool artist. I'll tell you. That. Yeah, is it a secret artist? It is secret. It's a secret artist. Hmm. And it will be revealed at a later date. Awesome. The last question I have, not really for you, but this is a question for Greg and IDW. I wonder. Are they going to renumber the TMNT hardcovers? Because I love those IDW hardcovers, and I know my viewers do too. And we're heading to about volume 17 when the whole series wraps up with issue 150. So will it be a new number one, kind of like they did phase two with Transformers? Oh, my God, that's beautiful, by the way. I love that. I would love that. Jason, you get the brand new number one. That would be cool. Just saying. Uh, but maybe, you know, those will be announced at a later time or revealed at a later time. Again, big thank you to IDW and Greg for helping us put this together. Jason, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and talk to us. I'm looking forward to reading not just Ninja Turtles, but Uncle Scrooge, too. Somebody was asking if you were done with Marvel, and I was like, I hope not, because he's writing Uncle Scrooge. Nope. I also have an I have another Marvel book that'll be announced pretty soon. Should be hitting solicits pretty soon. So yeah. Okay. We'll be, we'll be seeing we'll be reading about it very soon. Awesome. And then and you've got DC stuff, Superman and Batman. You're just playing with yeah. all our toys. Superman the action comic story just wrapped up. Batman off world's still going. Um I'm doing a berserker one shot for for Boom and Boom. That's yeah. also that's also in, in June, same time as as uh scrooge um and then yeah the other stuff i can't talk about yet mm. we do we didn't even get a chance to talk about the reprints of the punisher max series ah dang it oh, all right, right. Yeah. you snuck one in on me shots can we expect some casey jones he's underrated i love casey jones so i would say yes you can't expect some casey jones Oh, yes. Awesome. Oh, my God. I would love to have Don Rosa and Jason Aaron at the same time. Then I can be the med <laughs> mediator and I can bring up DuckTales and Don Rosa can go off on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you bring it up. Let him go off yeah. on you. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you again, Jason. Don't forget to hit that like button on the way out. And that's it for us. Have a great one, everyone.